For our basis tonight, we're going to look in the fourth chapter of Ephesians, <clears throat> three verses of Scripture, <clears throat> verses 30 through 32 of this passage, some that uh, no doubt you have read many times before as I have. Uh, we're going to use them to talk about the sufferings of the Spirit. This will be our final lesson in this series dealing with the Holy Spirit. There are some other things that I'd like to talk about about the work of the Holy Spirit in the future when the Lord uh, leads in us sharing that. Um, and we'll get to that at a, at a future date. But uh, tonight, as we close out this series, let's think about this. Not so much to put us on a negative track. I don't want us to think so negatively about this, but yet just confront our thought processes again with uh, being aware that the Holy Spirit does indeed suffer at times. He can uh, be one who suffers and we'll try to explain that and explain some of the reasons for that in our lesson here tonight. Paul said these words to the Ephesians, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger <clears throat> and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Most of us know what it is to experience some pain, suffering, or grief in our lives. We've lost loved ones. We know the grief associated with that. Uh, some more than others have had health situations that has brought about pain and suffering and we're all familiar with that uh, there are various aspects of suffering that we need to be aware of for example there are sufferings brought about by bodily pain that we experience there are sufferings related to our spirit being in sorrow such as it is when we lose that person that we have had in our lives uh, for so long, just like a parent, a dad or a mom, a child, uh, close friends, uh, additional family members when we lose them. Uh, there are sufferings associated with want or desire, especially when that want or desire is not fulfilled and it brings about a suffering spirit. There's also sufferings connected with <clears throat> wrongdoing that we are involved in doing sometimes or have been over the course of our lives or the wrongdoing that others have done to us who among us has not had those kind of situations. I'm sure we all have. Probably looking back <clears throat> over our years, every one of us can think of things that we did that brought a bit of um, pain and suffering to us. Um, maybe something that we should have known better to do uh, than we did. Um, I can think of some times in my life when I, physical pain incur, occurred because I I just did something that I shouldn't have done. Like, for example, one day I saw a hood, a hood spring. You guys know what I'm talking about. A hood spring was extended, and I thought, that looks too dangerous extended like that. So I, I pushed it down. And once I got it pushed down in place, like as if a hood were closed, but there was no hood on it, I thought, well, my goodness, that looks more dangerous now than it did when it was sticking out there. <laughs> so I walked up to that thing and I just went just like that. And before I knew it, it caught me and it had me 
and I was hung. I, there was no way I could get out of that spring. My finger, my knuckle and all was in that spring. And um, fortunately, my uncle and my first cousin were there and uh, they were under the car that we were working on. And I said, please, y'all got to get out and help me. <laughs> and so they did. And that wound up with a trip to the hospital and all that, you know. Uh, I, I know not to mess with a hood spring anymore, I promise you. If you ever have a hood spring problem, don't call the preacher. I, 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 I'm not going to mess with that thing anymore. Uh, we all know what it is, too, to have folks to do things that really bring pain and suffering in our lives. I'm sure probably every one of us has experienced that. I said all that to get to this point. <clears throat> we know now in our studying through the month of uh, September that the Holy Spirit is to be recognized as a person. He is the third person of the Trinity, the triune God, as you've heard me say already. As a person, does he experience suffering? I personally believe that he does. I believe he can. I believe he can experience suffering. Verse 30 in my way of thinking gives a very clear suggestion that that can be true because Paul said there, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. So just as you and I are grieved, he as a person must be grieved by certain things that uh, take place in the lives of the family of God and it brings grief to him. When we think of how he is often treated so wrongfully in our world today, our hearts really ought to be stirred. And that's what I hope to do tonight is stir us in our way of thinking, stir us in, in our heart and in our mind so that we will think more about <clears throat> how we should uh, try to exalt the Holy Spirit in our lives and uh, make him proud of what we do and how we are living our life. After all, the Lord has given him to us to be the one who guides us and sustains us each and every day. And he's not going to lead us into doing wrong things. If we go in the direction of doing wrong things, we will have made the choice to do that. And that, of course, will in turn bring sorrow to his heart. What kind of treatment does the Holy Spirit receive these days? Have you ever thought about it? How is the Holy Spirit really, really treated in this world? <clears throat> the more you think about it, and I've got, uh, I think, seven suggestions here tonight that I'm going to give you real quickly, and you can take them home with you and uh, study on them more, reflect on them a bit more. But uh, these are suggestions that come from uh, different portions of Scripture and so forth that I hope will speak to our hearts. First of all, I go over to Matthew chapter 12. <clears throat> And in Matthew 12, verse 31, Jesus said this, if your Bible is like mine and you have the words of Jesus in red, then these words are in the color red because they are spoken by the Lord. And he said, wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Now, I'm not going to talk about the unpardonable sin here. I've already taught a lesson on that uh, sometime in the past, and hopefully you remember that. But that's in view here in this passage. But watch this as we get on into verse 32. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So people can blaspheme the Holy Spirit and speak against the Holy Spirit. Uh, 
Jesus understood that. Now, what in the world caused Jesus to make this strong response, a very sharp response that we have here in these verses? Well, if you go back to verse 22 of this passage, we'll gain some insight by reading three more verses. <clears throat> then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. Wonderful, right? Everybody's happy about that, right? Well, not everybody. We would all be happy about that, but not everybody in that day was happy about it. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? They were inquisitive there, but notice verse 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall the kingdom stand? And he goes on then to speak these words that I just read to you in verses 31 and 32. What was happening? <clears throat> well, short the, the short version of the story is this. The Pharisees attributed the work of the healing of this man who was blind and dumb that brought about his ability to see and to talk. They attributed that work uh, of the Spirit to be the work of Satan. That's what was bringing this sharp response from the Lord Jesus. Uh, Jesus said in verse 28, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. And it was by the Spirit of God that he was able to do this. It was a great thing that he did there in bringing about the healing of this individual. But because they attributed the work of the Spirit to the work of Satan here, they blaspheme the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> not a good thing to do. And Jesus made it clear that that was not a good thing to do. Not a good thing for men to do today either. To presume that they know and they understand when in fact it may be just that the Holy Spirit is at work and whatever they say or allege could possibly be against the work of the Spirit and they could be blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Not a good thing to do. Number two, <clears throat> he is insulted oftentimes by the pride of men. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28 and 29, we find he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Men today think nothing about insulting the Holy Spirit. The pride of man, I think, is what causes him to do that. Because the pride of man will cause one to think that within themselves they are good enough to enter heaven without receiving the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior. But for anyone who believes that they are good enough to enter the kingdom of God any other way other than coming through Jesus Christ who said He was the way, the truth, and the life, anyone who does that places himself or herself in a most, most dangerous situation. 
people do that because of pride in their lives, I would suggest. An arrogant attitude that one has within themselves. Oftentimes that arrogance manifests itself in three ways, as the writer said there in Hebrews chapter number 10. Number one, it contemptuously treads on Christ as the Son of God. If you and I knew how many people in this world tonight simply do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God, it would amaze us. Because we think everybody believes that He's the Son of God, but not everybody does. Many people do not believe that He is the Son of God. Number two, it considers the blood of Christ to be powerless. In the arrogance of one's heart, they can say, I don't need that bloody religion. I don't want anything to do with that. And when that occurs, that brings sorrow, I believe, to the heart of the Holy Spirit because He is the convictor. He is the convincer. He is the one that causes a person to realize their need of a Savior. And... To say that the blood of Christ is powerless and has no, uh, no strength at all to save one must indeed bring grief and sorrow to the heart of the Holy Spirit while trying to build up the pride of men. His work and His drawing of men to God is insulted whenever folks say those kind of things. To deny the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ and the preciousness of His shed blood goes against the testimony, the very testimony, of the Holy Spirit regarding God's spotless Lamb. Goes against it. And so those kind of actions openly insult the Holy Spirit and indeed, I believe with all of my heart, cause Him to grieve. They cause him to have emotional pain just as we would have emotional pain if something like that were taking place that affected us so. Number three, he is vexed by the disobedience of men. Isaiah chapter 63 verses 7 through 10 give us an understanding and I'm just going to briefly tell you that Isaiah in his day many, many thousands of years ago now, hundreds of years ago, talked about redeemed people rebelling against God and vexing or grieving the sweet Spirit of God. That's what's in those verses that I just referred you to there. <clears throat> redeemed people re rebelling against and vexing or grieving the Spirit of God. In our day, how often do people with proud hearts rebel and refuse to confess their sin whenever they know good and well that they have committed sin in their life? Many people will not, absolutely will not. Many people knowing better will absolutely go ahead and do anyway what they know is wrong to begin with. That, I believe, brings sorrow to the heart of the Holy Spirit because He as our Comforter is leading and guiding each of the people of God into knowing the way of truth and living in the way of truth. He points out that which is right versus that which is wrong. And it is His desire that we choose that which is right always when the choice is not for that which is right and the choice is to go against the revealed will of God and the revealed knowledge that has been gained through the Holy Spirit that brings about a grieving of his spirit I believe the Holy Spirit he is grieved by the disobedience of men when there should be thankfulness for the discovery of having the Holy Spirit present in one's heart and life, 
stubborn will, a stubborn will sometimes will hinder an individual from experiencing and fully knowing the, the flow of the blessings that could be theirs if they would just obey God's instructions and obey the leadership of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Number four, <clears throat> he is resisted by the unbelief of men. Acts chapter 7. There is a powerful message there in Acts chapter 7 that was given by Stephen. And in the course of delivering that message, Stephen talked about Israel's unbelief and he makes the point that she did not believe as she should have believed very, very clear. It should be easily understood by anyone who reads that passage. The writer of Hebrews added to that by saying that many in Israel, in my words, were not able to enter the promised land back in the day when they were uh, in the wilderness and they were headed to the promised land, but they were not able to enter as a matter of fact, God struck them all dead there in the wilderness, didn't he? Raised up a new generation to take them from the age of 20 and below. He let them grow up and they went into the land of promise. Why did the others not get to go? One word, unbelief. Unbelief. And don't you think that God's heart was really, really... Uh, affected by that, I do. I think it was. I think, I think it really brought sorrow to the heart of the Lord and the heart of the Spirit. Um, I think so. Stephen addressed that in Acts chapter seven, and it brought about uh, an outpouring of rage upon him, so much so that they stoned him and they, they took his life from him. Yet he was faithful and he was true in declaring unto them what they need, uh, needed to hear. But the Holy Spirit today in great measure is resisted by the unbelief of men and women in our world. So every person in this world needs to beware. Mankind everywhere, men and women, young people who have reached the age of accountability, they need to beware. When the Word of God is doubted, then the Holy Spirit is being resisted because the Holy Spirit is here to guide us into all truth and to help us understand all truth. Unbelief is an expression of resistance to the voice of the Holy Spirit who speaks to make the word known to all men. Reveal it, open it to us. I couldn't understand it if it were not for the leadership of the Holy Spirit, neither could you. It would be like a closed book if it were not for the presence and power of the Holy Spirit uh, boy, I don't ever want to resist him, and I'm sure you don't either, uh, through unbelief. Number five, he is tempted by the insincerity of men. You know the story of Acts chapter five, the first nine verses very well. That's where Ananias and Sapphira made the promise that they were going to give so much of what they sold their possessions for and they would bring it in and they would lay it down at the foot of the, or the feet of the apostles. But what we read about there is that first Ananias came in and he didn't bring all that he was supposed to have brought. And God struck him dead right there before Peter. <clears throat> A little bit later, Sophia comes in, his wife, and Peter says, did you sell the property for such and such? Yes, we did. Well, then why have you lied to God? Why are you not bringing to God what you told God you would bring to Him? That kind of action grieves the Holy Spirit. I believe He was grieved then with the actions of Ananias and Sapphira. You see, 
They wanted the blessing of the Holy Spirit, but they didn't want to be completely obedient to the pledge that they had made before their brethren. And therefore, they paid the price. In seeking to deceive their brethren, they tempted and lied against the Holy Spirit. And Peter put it very, very bluntly to Sophia. He didn't mince any words. In verse 9, he said, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? You and Ananias, you agreed together. And this has brought about a tempting of the Spirit of the Lord. May I suggest unto us tonight that men and women today are guilty of the same thing when they pretend before their fellow believers to be totally devoted to God while at the time that they are doing that, they know for a sure fact that they are indulging in sin in their life and thinking that they've got it all hidden from everybody else in the world. That, my beloved friends, grieves the heart of the Holy Spirit. It grieves Him. It brings sorrow to His heart, I do believe. Such a person is tempting the Holy Spirit to just leave them in the clutches of self-deception. But thank God for the loving kindness of God and His long-suffering mercy. Amen. Number six, he is quenched by the prejudice of men. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, quench not the Spirit. That word quench there means to extinguish or to put out or to cool suddenly. This involves a person treating the Holy Spirit with indifference because the direction is already charted. And once that direction is charted and the person decides they don't want to go in that direction, that's not where they want to be, that's not what they want to do, then they do not follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit and instead quince it or put out His guidance or find it being extinguished to a degree in their life. Uh, we are not to extinguish the influence of the Holy Spirit in our heart. Beloved, what I hope every one of us know without me even saying it is simply this. If he says go, then go and don't ask questions. I heard a preacher last night that was preaching on that subject and it tied in with this lesson here because he said, if, if God is saying go, He don't expect you to stand there and ask all kinds of questions about why and where and how and uh, so on and so forth. He just expects you to go, follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. The more we follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the more we will be blessed, the happier the Holy Spirit is. There will be no grieving of His heart, no quenching of His leadership in our lives. Things which decrease the enthusiasm of worship in one's heart may be also regarded as a quenching of the Spirit, like, for example, worldliness. Worldliness can cause a quenching of the Spirit. Pride can cause a quenching of the Spirit. Ambition can do the same, and the list goes on of many, many things. Bitterness can do that. Paul listed a number of things in verse 31. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, malice. Those things are to be put away because they are things that bring sorrow to the heart of the Holy Spirit. And so as I close, we find that Paul here in Ephesians 4, in earlier verses, <clears throat> talks about the actions of mankind that bring sorrow to the Holy Spirit. It gets him down to the point of really thundering forth like he does in verse number 30 and grieve not the Holy Spirit. Uh, we are sealed by that Holy Spirit. In verses 17 through 30 of this passage, Paul talks about how a believer is to walk 
in their new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we grow in that walk, then we should be more determined to do the things that he says here. And he mentions a number of things that ought not to be a part of the life of a, of a believer as they grow in the Lord and walk in the sunshine of the love of God under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> things that they are taught by the Holy Spirit and taught through the Word of God. For example, we're to put on the new man. We're not to uh, uh, walk as the Gentiles walked in the vanity of their mind, Paul says, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. When we have been made alive in Christ and we are shown the way that is right, we are to walk in that way. We're to find ourselves, as he said in verse 26, just to, to, to pick out a, one or two things that he says here. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Don't give place to the devil. Put away all lying, evil speaking, and things like that. No wonder he gets to the point of saying right here what he does. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. These things will grieve the heart of the Holy Spirit. They will bring sorrow to Him. Failure to walk as one should causes the Holy Spirit to be grieved and brought to sorrow. I truly believe that. Paul explained the way for a believer to walk and then he cautioned. And I close with that caution again. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Father, thank you for our time together tonight. I know I've covered this really, really fast, really rapidly, but I pray that we've said enough that the Holy Spirit will be able to take it and use it in each of our hearts and lives. And I pray, Father, that we will walk steadfastly in the way that is right and true, doing the things that please and honor you and that make you smile as well as uh, warm the heart of the Holy Spirit who is guiding us each and every day. I'm so thankful for the presence of the Holy Spirit in my heart and life, Lord. I'm thankful that you sent him to take up his abode in our hearts whenever we receive you as our personal Savior. And I'm so thankful that he guides and directs in our lives and he goes before us. I'm so thankful, Lord, for that leadership. Guide us ever onward and upward as we continue to yield to you, we pray in the wonderful, precious name of Jesus. Amen.